जय राघ मधवा कुंज विहारी
जम्मून धीरा धान शाहरियन जय राधा माधवा कुंज बिहारे हम जय राधा माधवा कुंज बिहारे हम Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 8, Chapter 5, The Demigods Appeal to the Lord. This is text 24. Sri Sukha Uvacha Ityabhasya Suram Vedhyam Sahadeva Arindama Ajitasya Padam Saksaj Jagama Tamasa Param Sri Sukha Uvacha Ityabhasya Suram Veda Sahadevair Arindama Ajitasya Padam Saksaj Jagama Tamasa Param Sri Sukha Uvacha Ityabhasya Suram Veda Sahadeva Rindama Ajitasya Padam Saksaj Jagama Tamasa Param Ladies,
You don't do that. It's not done in the middle of the sentence. <clears throat> Even though there's a dot underneath, it's only on the second and the last line of the verse. Because Sanskrit is in two, two, two lines, not four lines. So the last line, the last part of the first and second line, you can do that, the emphasis, but not in the middle. Okay? So it's Jagamad Tamasa Param. Yeah, just so you know. <laughs> okay. Sri Sukha Uvacha. <coughs> Sri Sukhadeva Goswami said, Iti, thus, Abhasya, talking, Saran, unto the demigods, Veda, Lord Brahma, who is the head of the universe, and who is the head of this universe, and who gives everyone good sense in Vedic knowledge. Saha with Devai, the demigods. Arim Dhamma, O Maharaj Parikshit, subduer of all kinds of enemies, such as the senses. Ajitasya, of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Padam, to the place, Saksat, directly, Jagama, went, Tamasa, the world of darkness, Padam, transcendental to, beyond. Sukadeva Goswami is addressing Maharaj Parikshit. O Maharaj Parikshit, Sadur of all enemies. After Lord Brahma finished speaking to the demigods, he took them with him to the abode of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, which is beyond this material world. The Lord's abode is on an island called Svetadvipa, which is situated in the ocean of milk. <clears throat> Purport is quite long. So please listen up. Maharaj Parikshit is addressed here as Arindama, Sadur of all enemies. Not only do we have enemies outside of our bodies, but within our bodies there are many enemies, such as lusty desires, anger, and greed. Maharaj Parikshit is specifically addressed as Arindama because in his political life he was able to subdue all kinds of enemies, and even though he was a young king, as soon as he heard that he was going to die within seven days, he immediately left his kingdom. He did not follow the dictates of enemies within the body, such as lust, greed, and anger. He was not at all angry with the Muni's son who had cursed him. Rather, he accepted the curse and prepared for his death in the association of Sukadev Goswami. <coughs> death is inedible. Inevitable, no one can surpass the force of death. Therefore, Maharaj Parikshit, while fully alive, wanted to hear Srimad Bhagavatam. He is consequently addressed here as Arindama. Another word, Surapriya, is also significant. Although Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, is equal towards everyone, he is especially inclined toward his devotees. Ye bhajanti tumam bhaktya mai te te shu chapyaham. The devotees are all demigods. There are two kinds of men within this world. One is called the deva and the other is called the asura. The Padma Purana states, Dao bhuta sargo loke smin daiva asura eva cha vishnu bhakta smiton daivam asura tal viparyaya. Anyone who is not who is a devotee of Lord Krishna is called a deva, 
and others, even though they may be devotees of demigods, are called asuras. Ravana, for example, was a great devotee of Lord Shiva, but he is described as asura. Similarly, Harani Kashipu was described as a great devotee of Lord Brahma, yet he was also an asura. Therefore, only the devotee of Lord Vishnu is called sura, not asura. Lord Krishna is very much pleased with his devotees, even if they are not on the topmost stage of devotional service. Even on the lower stages of devotional service, one is transcendental, and if one continues with devotional life, he continues to be, he continues to be a deva or sura. If one continues in this way, Krishna will always be pleased with him and will give him all instruction so that he may be, may very easily return home back to Godhead. Concerning Ajityas Padam, the abode of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in the milk ocean of the material world, Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says, Padam Shirodadi Sta Sweta Dvipam Tamasam Prakrite Param. The island known as Sweta Dvipa, which is in the ocean of milk, is transcendental. It has nothing to do with this material world. A city government may have a rest house where the governor and important government officers stay. Such a rest house is not an ordinary house. Similarly, although Sweta Dweep, which is the ocean of milk, is in the material world, it is called Param Padam, transcendental. Om Agyan Timidandasya Gyana Jana Salakaya Chaksun Militam Nena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale Srimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaudavani Pacharine Nirvisesa Sunyavadi Pastyatya De Satarine Anchakalpa Turubisya Kripa Sindhu Bevacha Patitanam Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadara Sivasari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare mm. So, Prabhupada covers a lot of different points in this particular verse. Mm. Yeah. Uh, we very rarely understand that there are enemies within. We, we really define enemies as someone outside of us. Mm. So that seems to be the application of the word, the definition of the word enemy. But here it's mentioned that there are internal enemies, and actually there are when you actually make a comparison, you'll find they're more deadlier than the external enemies. Because the internal enemies are right next to you every second. <laughs> they're actually, any at any moment, they're ready to uh, strike. That's why Prabhupada would say, the senses are servants or serpents. <laughs> A serpent is a snake, and a snake carries poison in its teeth, and its tendency is to bite whenever possible. And if one gets bitten, poison comes in, and then just a matter of time before death appears. So the senses are sometimes compared to something that can work against you. In other words, you, being the soul, is trying to awaken your love for Krishna, engage in devotional service, but the mind which directs the senses has other ideas. <laughs> it has other ideas. It wants to go this way or that way to experience sense objects in this material world. Or to just to divert one's attention away for no apparent reason, <laughs> away from devotional service. So one has to very carefully with great determination, strictly control the mind and senses. And it says there's three ways you can do that. <clears throat> it says one way is to 
fully engage in devotional service of the Lord. So that may not always be, we may not always be up to that standard where we can fully engage 24 hours a day. But that is the, what we say, complete shelter and the complete nullification of the senses acting in any other way. And then you have another one, is that to meditate on the instructions of the spiritual master, that we can perform regularly, where we are always thinking how to serve in this particular situation we find ourselves in. What is the instructions given to us in each and every circumstance we find ourselves in? And all of that is covered in the Shastras, by Srila Prabhupada, by his words, by his books, and we also learn by experience. And then the last one, they say another way to control the mind is saying, senses is always think how to do good for others. <laughs> and then that way one's mind is away from one's own apparent problems. We usually have problems when we think about it, and then we don't think about it, we don't have a problem. <laughs> So that's why we say, you know, forget about it, it'll go away. <laughs> and problems are just creations of the mind any, anyway. Yeah, this one, like Prahlad Maharaj, <clears throat> when his father, Rani Kashibu, was trying to instruct him into various political ideas on how to rule, hoping that his son would become a great, you know, king following in his footstep and would rule the universe like he has. And he was a, one of the principal was how to destroy your enemies. This is one of the teachings of political science, at least. How to, you know, identify and then eliminate your enemies. When Prahlad Maharaj was hearing that, he simply says, My dear father, the only enemy is your own mind. <laughs> That's all. Friends and enemies are created simply by the mind, like that. And we see that too. Someday somebody is our friend, and somebody, that same person does something different, and then all of a sudden it changes, the relationship changes. And so friends and enemies are just creations of the mind, like that. And we can make friends, or we can make, we can designate enemies simply by how the mind is working this way or that way. So these are the more den dangerous enemies here. <laughs> Maharaj Parikshit is being used here as an example of one who should or may even could have got easily angered being unjustly cursed by a Brahmin boy for something that was so small. He apparently was <clears throat> not given attention and he simply took a dead snake and put it around the father of Shringi. Uh, what was his name? Who remember? Huh? Shemika Rishia, yeah. He was in meditation. He didn't see the king. The king was traveling. He was thirsty. He wanted some water. He asked uh, the Rishi. The Rishi was in meditation and wasn't even aware of the king's presence. So he got disturbed, apparently. And he took a snake that was on the ground with a stick. He lifted it up with a stick and put it around. And he said, you're such a great sage, here's your garland. So that was unusual for Maharaj Pariksha to act like that. But apparently this happened by the arrangement of the Lord for a greater, greater reason. But Shringi, his 12-year-old son, immediately got angry when he heard about it. And he unjustly uh, in a, cursed the king to die within seven days, be bitten by some kind of poisonous snake, which is a flying snake. When uh, Shamik Rish heard that, he, pff, he was shocked. He said, you have the king, the, the king of the world, you have cursed him to die? He was really upset with his son, but the curse was given. Maharaj could have, he actually could have nullified it. But he didn't. He accepted it as the arrangement of the Lord and took the opportunity to retire from political life, family life, and sat down to hear Bhagavatam for seven days spoken by Sukadev Goswami and became fully self-realized. So it was an advantage. 
Uh, he could have got angry. He could have counter-cursed the, the boy also. He had that power. But he didn't do any of these things. So he says his internal enemies didn't were not active like that. So we see here how great souls, when they are, may even have reasons to become uh, or you know, get envious or angry or greedy or whatever, um, they check it with their own uh, power of their spiritual practice. They remember Krishna and they become very forgiving. And one of the most important of all qualities <clears throat> of a Vaishnava is forgiveness. <laughs> it's considered to be a very lofty principle of social existence, learning how to forgive others' transgressions against you in one form or another. Prabhupada would use the example of Lord Jesus Christ when he was being crucified. He was praying <coughs> to the Lord to forgive his persecutors, and not even considering any negativity toward them. So there's an example of a great soul, how a great soul doesn't take personal offense. They see everything as a higher arrangement. But, you know, we may not always be like that, just like we have, I was just reading in Srila Prabhupada's account, oh, well, actually it's Giri Raj Maharaj's book, I'll Build You a Temple, the Juhu story. There is one, Prabhupada quotes uh, Ravindranath, Ravindranath Tagore that Uh, to do harm to other is wrong and to allow others to do harm to you is also wrong. <laughs> Prabhupada quotes that. And he uses that as the, well, you know, when Mr. Nair <laughs> tried to cheat the devotees and also cause great physical and, you know, harm to the devotees, broke the temples, arranged for all these things. Um, Prabhupada fought back, <laughs> fought back in a very determined way. And Prabhupada quotes this particular, this was after Mr. Nair had his heart attack and was no longer there. Prabhupada quotes this, he said, this is the Kshatriya mood. He doesn't say it's a, a principle that we follow through the whole principle of devotional service. He said the Kshatriya you know, mood, apa chapalayanam. The, 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 the spirit of fighting, that if somebody wants to harm you, you should not allow that to happen. <laughs> and Prabhupada uses that as an example of how, how we fought back when they were trying to cause us so many problems like that. So those of you who are Kshatriyas, you can appreciate that. <laughs> Which is usually the European mood. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of a Kshatriya culture, the Europeans. So, yeah, so, but in a general sense, we find here Sukadeva Goswami or Maharaj Pariksit, he's, he's not like that. <laughs> he's actually acting in a different way. He's more acting on the Brahminical platform, although it's interesting because he is in the role of a Kshatriya. He's a ruling king. So we see, you know, there will always be people who will cause us difficulty in life. This is just the way life is, you know, there's, there's three miseries, Adiyatmika, Adibautika, and Adidaipika. Jai Pancha Tattva Ki Jai. And Adibautika means miseries by other living entities. So that, can't, that, that comes by living in the world. You know, you're sitting peacefully, you're trying to read, and there's some mosquito who won't let you alone, or some fly, or something, you know. Or there's, some, there's always some little living entity, either visible, invisible, small, big. And Prabhupada said even the government gives you trouble all the time. They're also doing that right now. Try playing with people's lives. You can't do this, you can't do that. And if you don't do this, you won't be able to do that. You know, and if you, don't, if you do this, we like you. And if you don't do this, you know, we're going to get you. So it's just, you know, it's just the way the world is. It's just full of difficulty, Dali Baltica. is an increasing also. But the devotees all have to learn how to deal with that. And, but the idea is to learn how to become tolerant. <laughs> and learn how to become tolerant of all these. Uh, 
because tolerance is one of the highest principles of execution of devotional service. That's why Lord Chaitanya made that a, a statement of emphasis when he spoke that verse, Trinata Peace on Ichena. Tayori Vasa Hishnu Namani Namamanadena Kirtaniya Sadarahi. A person who is not tolerant will become disturbed even from the smallest things. You know. Today, you're, you know, you're really, you haven't been, maybe you fasted for breakfast, so you haven't eaten breakfast, so it's now it's time for lunch. And you go there and you're, and you're just looking forward to the doll and somebody burnt the doll today. Oh, God, my God. Get that guy out of the kitchen. <laughs> So, you know, this is, you know, you, you, what can you do? It's like you know, your hopes for either normal, norm, normality or some enjoyment is being sometimes, you know, interfered with by the way of the world. <laughs> this is the way it is. <laughs> Prabhupada talks about one man. He said, oh, I wanted to live happily, so I decided to build a house so I could be happy, but the house burned down. <laughs> Using that as an example of how everybody has big plans, but then everything changes. So learning how to tolerate all the disturbances, reverses in life, and they're always, they'll always be like that. And then the ultimate reverse is, I want to live forever in this body, in this material world. Death is for somebody else, right? It's not for me. I heard about it. I also know people who have experienced it, but I'm different. <laughs> This is, not was it, Yudhisthira Maharaj actually said that. This is the most incredible thing in the world. That everyone's seeing their friends, family members, and others are dying and they're thinking, it's for them. <laughs> it's not for me. But this is somewhat, what we say, detrimental to one's spiritual life to kind of push that aside because... By remembering that death can appear at any time, we become more serious in our execution of devotional service. That's important because these the, the thing the, the the calamities and sufferings of the material world are reminders how important it is to become Krishna conscious. <laughs> so, in one sense, they're also beneficial when they come by way of Krishna. The top, what is that verse? Hmm. Tate nu sankam pa susha miksha manam pujane va kripham vipa kam vidha hubir vidadana maste jiveti yo mukti padesha dayabak. That Krishna sometimes gives us some difficulties, some suffering, some whatever, for whatever reason. And it's just to purify one a little bit, make one humble, one, one detached from some form of sense gratification. But a devotee doesn't see, oh, why is Krishna doing that to me? He's all the all-powerful supreme controller. He can control everything. Why is he allowing it to happen? Maybe he's not doing it, but he's allowing me, me to suffer anyway. So sometimes in the back of our mind, or maybe even a little more forefront, we kind of think, what happened? Krishna's not on duty. He took a break. <laughs> you know, Chaturmasya, yeah, he's... Uh, he's uh, He's observing the milk fast and he can't play with the cows during that time. So, <laughs> so yeah, so it's, 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 it's just part of life that we have to somehow or other accept when Krishna makes some arrangements. And then this verse, this verse is very, very important. Because Prabhupada put this verse as one of the most important verses for devotees to learn and to understand. Tate Nukampa Shushamikshamanu Srimad Bhagavatam 10th Canto 14th chapter verse number 8 10 14 8 Yeah Spoken by Lord Brahma himself <laughs> After Krishna had foiled his attempts to steal the cowherd boys and calves and then he woke up to his senses and starts glorifying the Lord like that that 14th chapter is one of the most powerful chapters in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Sometimes we say that during the month of uh, Purushottam Mas, which comes once in every 27 months, which is the most holiest of all months, even more so than Kartik, 
that that we should read that chapter each day at least once a day read the entire chapter that's a recommendation austerity for that month because Bhagavatam comes as one of the services that one should emphasize during that month more more and more Bhagavatam particularly that particular chapter so that verse is very important for us to understand and to apply because it helps us to become stay fixed in devotional service there's two things that can knock you out of devotional service things that go wrong and unexpectedly and things that go too right <laughs> hmm. what i mean by that is that sometimes certain niceties that come in krishna consciousness can be a deviation in our own devotional life like sometimes if you, uh, you know, maybe you inherit some money from a deceased relative and now all of a sudden you have a lot of wealth. Now that could also cause you to become less enthusiastic in Krishna consciousness. We spend more time worrying about that. Or just getting involved with different kinds of businesses and trying to make so much money like that. And then we think, oh, I'll give my mo the money to Krishna. But then when you get involved with businesses, what do you do? You spend all your time putting money into the business, trying to increase the business, trying to, you know, compete with those who have the same business. So there's a lot of so-called niceties, apparently, that can also divert our attention away from the goal of life. So we have to see both of these, not just the apparent things that we don't like. Here, there's another category of enemies, and that is the, the demons. <clears throat> the demons are a class of people that are a created race. Sometimes we think someone becomes a demon, but actually there are actually planets where our demoniac uh, living entities live. Uh, sometimes they're called rakshasas, shakshasas, and yeah, yakshas, not so bad, jinns. What else? Uh, uh, Pishachas and Kusmandas. <laughs> There's a whole list of lower beings. Uh, Bhutanas. Bhutanas also, but Putanas also. There's a long, long list. And, and they're also highly developed beings. They are very intelligent materially. And when a certain area of the world becomes more and more sinful, you find more and more demons and uh, it start taking birth in that area. That's why Prabhupada said in 1972 in one lecture, he said, the demons are only increasing. He said they will increase and increase and increase. This one he said, but devotees, uh, you have to be like Prahlad Maharaj. You have to take shelter of Krishna and chant the holy names of the Lord. He uses the example of Prahlad Maharaj and Devaki, both, who are being harassed by powerful demons such as Kamsa and Aranyakashipu. But what did they do? They took full shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and then Krishna, and Krishna's protection is complete. But if one doesn't take shelter, although one may be a devotee, one may find themselves being disturbed and harassed by such living entities. And these living ent this principle is an eternal principle. This verse from the Padma Purana, it says that as there are, are devas, there are also asuras. They are eternal. As long as the material world exists, there will always be demons and they will always give trouble to others. Like that. It's like I know one devotee right now, he's going through a lot of suffering. He's being attacked by, I know a couple that are being attacked by demons at night in their sleep for whatever reasons, personal reasons or, and other reasons. But, you know, he can actually see these horrible faces appearing in his dreams. And so, you know, these people exist <laughs> and they exist on this planet. And as the balance of karma shifts to more sinful activities, you'll find more and more of these beings are inhabiting this level. So devotees uh, don't have anything to fear, but we should always be very careful to make sure we take full shelter of Krishna, always like that. Like that. So this is, you know, he's probably, you're going to expect harassment, he said. 
they will give you trouble, but always take shelter of Krishna, and Krishna will give you the protection. And then Prabhupada deals with one other point that um, that even great personalities like Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva, they give shelter to such beings, such as Rani Kashipu, Ravana, Kamsa, what's, what was his name, that one that fought with uh, Banasura, yeah. he fought with uh, uh, with uh, Krishna, but he was a disciple, a disciple of Lord Shiva. So you see, these great powerful demigods who are in charge of the modes of passion and ignorance, they give shelter to these demons because these demons perform the austerities and take shelter of the devas. The devas are, can give material powers, more material powers, and therefore they want benedictions and powers from these devas. And just like even Haravana was a, he was a devotee of Lord Shiva. He, he actually pleased Lord Shiva, and Lord Shiva gave him, gave him a benediction. <clears throat> And then he, he considered Lord Shiva his worshipable Lord. And he became very powerful. One who worships Lord Shiva in a proper way can, will become very materially opulent. <laughs> very material opulent. That's mentioned in the Bhagavatam also, where it says the devotees of Vishnu, uh, they're not so rich. <laughs> and the devotees of Shiva, they got money. <laughs> Vishnu is opulent and his devotees have nothing and Shiva has nothing and his devotees are opulent. <laughs> yeah, it's like that. I remember, well, one story Prabhupada tells about Lord Shiva. Parvati says to Lord Shiva, my dear Prabhu, she, she calls him Prabhu, uh, you know, you are a very powerful, you know, personality, and you have so much influence. And I am the personification of the material energy. And we don't even have a house. We're living under a tree. What to do? So why don't you get us a house? You know, you know, Mataji's need houses. So, because so if you're going to get married, plan on that ahead of time. You know. Because they want houses, you know. They can't live in huts or in ashrams. <laughs> so, he, uh, Shiva says, all right. And so he arranges for a house to be built. So now they have a house, and then they're going to have a housewarming ceremony to welcome, you know, that open the house. It's part of Vedic culture to inaugurate living into the house. So they invite many sages and other personalities to come to the ceremony. Well, that is a very big ceremony, and it's over. Now, it's the duty of the host to remunerate the guests. These were sages and saints, Brahmins. You have to give some charity to the Brahmanas. So, when it came time for that, Shiva, he doesn't have anything. <laughs> so, he gave his house. <laughs> he was back underneath the bell tree. <laughs> so yeah, he's not so interested. I remember uh, when I was in America, I was I met one very powerful. Uh, it was a woman. You know, she was very powerful spiritualist, and uh, she would she would dress really fancy. But she was a worshiper of Lord Shiva. And she would she would teach devotees people to worship Shiva and pray to Shiva and chant mantras to Shiva. She was very opulent, very you know. She was young, quite you know by material standards, quite good looking. Had a lot of wealth, <laughs> a lot of wealth, and her followers were also becoming better, more material or opulent. So I knew that she actually was not really a devotee of Lord Shiva. She was a devotee of Lord Krishna, but she kept it she kept it hidden because you can't make any money by being a devotee of the Lord. 
<laughs> Lord Krishna. But yeah, she saw me. I came dressed like this, and she kind of like knowledge, say, yeah, yeah, Hare Krishna. <laughs> but I knew she was. Uh, I knew because there was other things in her life that indicated that she was a devotee of Lord Krishna. And uh, so, but you know, it wasn't very profitable. <laughs> And she was very popular. I can't remember her name, but she was. Uh, yeah, I think she's still around. She's quite. She was quite young at the time. That was about forty years ago, back in the nineteen eighties. Yeah. So um, the devotees of um, Brahma, Shiva, any of them are, uh, you know, lower class beings like that. So, but here, this particular verse is just emphasizing the importance of taking shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and not becoming attracted to anything material. And even though, because the devotees, they can get anything they want. If you perform devotional service, you can be rich. <laughs> if you're not rich, you're not performing devotional service. <laughs> At least in the sense that Krishna will always provide for his devotees. Of course, if a devotee is humble and doesn't want anything, Krishna will give him anything, everything. <laughs> and then that devotee will use it for spreading Krishna consciousness. But if a devotee wants it and Krishna sees, well, this is, this is not going to be good for their spiritual life, he may not give it. Or he may give just what they need and live to keep body and soul together. But Prabhupada said, Krishna can give us the whole world, but he says, you're not ready. You can't, you don't know what to, you wouldn't know what to do with it. That's what he, Prabhupada said. <laughs> we have to become ready to use whatever Krishna gives us in, in Krishna consciousness so we can spread Krishna consciousness. And living is not very hard for a devotee. A devotee can be happy with just the basic things in life. Okay, so there's much more to this purport. Um, the last statement that it, there is a planet in the material world called Sweta Dweep, where the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Vishnu, stays, and that's where Brahma is going to speak to the Lord in order to get some help in this particular situation with the demigods are now in trouble. <laughs> Okay, any questions or comments? Yes, Mataji. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj, for your wonderful class. Um, if I remember well, hmm? uh, if I remember well, then I hear you saying when you were reading the purport, um, Although something like, although Brahma was a great devotee, he still was a Asura. And I didn't get that one because that means that he was a demon. Is it because he stole the calves? No, no, Lord Brahma is not, he's a great demigod, but those, there are personalities who come to him who are demons for material benedictions, such as Harani Kashi Pur. So he gives favors to the demons if they perform the proper austerities. Oh yeah, I thought. He is not a demon. No, that's that's what I. Heard. No, it doesn't I, say that in the some, Oh, then I re then I read it in the in the wrong way. I, I was wondering why it's written like although Brahma was a great devotee, he was a asura. I d didn't. But maybe I wrote I I read it in a wrong way. So then I've been mistaken. You saw this this also? Although Brahma is a great devotee and then he was he was a Asura. No, yeah. no that that's the, the answer is no, but it was written like that. Okay, but uh, don't pay attention to it. I thought I saw it written like He's that. Definitely not in no, no, that's no he is not like that, but it was written like that. That's was my point. Yeah, but, but don't speak that too much because maybe his yeah. wife will get mad at you. <laughs> yeah. Therefore, only the devotees of Lord Vishnu called mm -hmm. Surah. Lord Krishna is very much pleased with the devotees. Mm -hmm. like, uh, yeah. 
Rani Prasi Puta describes the great devotee of Lord Brahma, yet he was also in a sura. You yes, see, that's not, what... Not Brahma, but Harani Kashipu. Ah. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, sentence, it's just the English, the way the English is being explained. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Anything else? Yes, Mataji. Behind. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I will read uh, the questions from Alvatuta Radha Dasa. Oh, first, one question bothers me. In the Priti Sanvursa, it said, according to the method of attaining the Lord after attaining Brahman, one attains Bhagavan as seen in the case of Ajmila. Question is this a uh, general path go to the Brahma Jyoti then to Krishna Loka? How long c we will stay in the Jyoti? And as per Raghavad Chandrika, we first go to Brahma Vrindavana, the universe where Krishna has his Lila manifest. You speak so nicely, but I couldn't understand anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. Maybe. Uh, yeah. Someone else? Uh, maybe somebody else can. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's better if you don't sing it. It's better if you speak it. Uh, how about, yeah. In this general path, go to the Brahma Jyoti, then to Krishna Loka. How about, uh, would you like to read the verse? Let him read it. All you ladies speak so so sweetly that I'm only falling asleep. He's been well versed in English. <laughs> One question bother me, bothers me. In the Priti Sandarbha it is said, according to the method of attaining the Lord, after attaining Brahman, one attains Bhagavan, as seen in the case of Ajamil. Right. So the question is, is this a general path? Go to the Brahma Jyoti, then to Krishna Loka. How long will we stay in the Jyoti? And, okay, first maybe this. No, it's not a general path. The answer is no, it's not a general path. It is, that's, that's a path that is there, but it's not the general path. The general path is Mahajano Yena Katasapanta. The follow in the footsteps of the, the great Acharyas. To simply engage in devotional service under the guidance of the spiritual master, and one makes progress through the different levels of bhakti. Then there's nine stages, and when you come to uh, the ninth stage, which is Prema Bhakti, pure love of God, and that's perfection. That's Bhagavan realization. So that's not, that's just, that, that's an example for others who have attained it in that way. But that is not our method for, for practice. And then the second question is, Shukadeva Goswami was testing the proficiency of Parikshit when giving the process of atonement according to karma. But didn't Shukadeva Goswami already know the ability of Parikshit? Can you do that again? A little slower? Okay. Shukadeva Goswami was testing the proficiency of Parikshit okay. yeah, when giving the process of atonement according to karma. But didn't Shukadeva already know the ability of Parikshit. Didn't he know what? The ability. 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 He, did he know that the ability of Maharaj Priest? So he was testing him? Yeah, that's the... Was, that well, he was, was he, testing the proficiency of Parikshit. I don't know what this how means. How was he testing the proficiency? I don't know. It's not written here. <laughs> No, he was just testing him how he was going to react to the situation. Yeah, well, the guru has to test you just to see where you're, where you're at. Yeah, that's, that's fine. And that's in line with our tradition. The guru is, it has to test the disciples. 
And that's, that's just to make them more Krishna conscious. If you don't like getting tested, then too bad. <laughs> no, I, I mean, uh, I, I mean, I know one young lady, she's married now. She said when I first joined, and I wanted to practice Krishna consciousness, my spiritual master said, you live in the, you live in the Brahmacharini ashram for one year. She said, that was my test, I had to do it. And she said, I will. I did it, and I'm happy I did it. So the Guru has to test the disciples like that. Not just let the disciple do whatever they want in the name of Krishna consciousness. Sri Devi, you got a question? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Maharaj, for give, Guru Maharaj, for giving this class. Um, I was also, like Mataji, puzzled a little bit about this description of people who are devotees of demigods, and Srila Prabhupada says they are called asuras. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people, especially in India, are worshippers of demigods, mm -hmm. and they are pious as far as I can... Prabhupada's emphasizing one, one class, that's all. Oh, okay. I right. read other parts, there are people who worship the demigods like that. But if you you go, the idea is, instead of worshiping the Supreme Personality of Godhead, which is our constitutional nature, we're worshiping something, we're worshiping the material energy. That's what mm -hmm. we're doing. We're worshiping.